today we have Matt Lamb from Commerce Guys. He has flown over from Kenosha, near where Making the Murderers films, to speak here today. And he's very active in the community and a co-maintainer of Commerce 2.x. He's met a few of you already, but he doesn't get the idea of last orders at 11pm. So here's Matt Lamb from Commerce Guys. First, I want to say thanks for having me. Um, I'm glad to be here. So, I wanted to talk in my keynote about open source and community and opportunity. And the spin I wanted to take on it was about my own story. So, five years ago, I was throwing, to this day, five years ago, I was throwing half barrels of green beer in bars, probably about 40 this week into just one single bar alone. And now I'm here keynoting in London, and I honestly have a lot of people in this room probably to thank and the Drupal community as a whole. Um, so I just want to talk about why you know open source, the community, and the opportunities we build are really important. I mean, I don't have a super special story, but I think it's one that everybody could maybe connect to in a little bit to realize what makes open source and even Drupal great. Um, so yeah, so a little bit more about myself. Senior Drupal consultant at Commerce Guys. Um, as Alex said, Drupal Commerce co-maintainer. Um, I don't know if any of you have used ContribConban.com, but that's something I whipped up a few years ago to make sprinting easier at the Global Sprint Week in 2015. And I also authored the Drupal 8 Development Cookbook last year. Um, so what is open source? Um, the definition that I like best was from opensource.com. It says something people can modify and share because it's publicly accessible. Because it's not just code. There's more to open source and the idea than just free software. Um, so I firmly believe that open source can open new doors. Um, so like in my case, I was, like I said, it's delivering beer. Um, I did web development as a hobby, and then a local firm happened to have a job opening. And I was like, all right, I'm sick of this, my knees and back are going to, to shot. Um, and because of open source, I could review and learn. I went in, it was a WordPress site that I had to build as my interview, and well, I don't know what to do. so. When I say review and learn, I mean I Googled and I Googled hard to figure out how to how to build it, and then, you know, now I can actually look at the source and be like, ah, oh, there's the answer. Um, I didn't need training or formal education, and that was a big part of an issue that I had. Um, originally, I had an associate's degree in IT networking, so I was like, oh, I'll be like a sysadmin. Well, everything wanted a certificate. Certificate. I was like, I didn't have the money to go do that training, um, so open source allowed me to educate myself, and then. I was as knowledgeable as I chose to be, and that's kind of true now. If I want to learn something, I go do it for the book. I just looked at the source code and I, I dove in um, because I couldn't Google anything because it was back in like alpha and beta of Drupal 8. Um, so as I said, I first started and I developed with WordPress for about six months and then in March 2013, I built my first Drupal site um, for an e-commerce client, and it was on Commerce Kickstart 2, where I unknowingly installed, well, I knowingly installed the demo site, built the whole site, and then realized that you can't un uninstall the demo. <laughs> and spent two weekends rebuilding it, and also pulled out a lot of hair, and fretted a lot because, well, Drupal Commerce, it can, oh, it can either be really great for you, or it can also make you kind of go like, what? Um, so I'm still here, though. So I got hooked, even though I spent about three months being so frustrated. Um, and there's, a key, there's some key reasons to that. Other options felt too closed. A lot of the e-commerce software out there that's open source is on a very freemium type deal. Like Magento alone has Community Edition, which is OK. But then if you buy their, their premium, their enterprise, whatever they call it, you get a better solution. Same with WooCommerce. WooCommerce is free, but yet they nickel and dimed you for any extension where I uh, showed up at Drupal and was like, oh, you have this, you have this. They're handing modules out like Oprah would on her show. <laughs> um, Drupal.org itself really sold me too. Um, I have a plugin on WordPress.org and there's no way to provide support. There's like a support form. And I get to Drupal and it's like, oh, there's, there's project pages, there's issue queues. I know who the maintainers are and people who have worked on it and I can easily get a hold of them. 
And the issue keys alone just helped me a lot with support and going through the previous items and being able to solve my problems. Support in IRC, which I know a lot of people hate IRC, but I personally loved it. I treat it as fishing, you know, throw out a line, be patient, wait, someone's going to help you. I was this new person, had no idea what I was doing, way over my head, but I had people I didn't know helping me and a chat client to solve my problems that they had no incentive to help me on. And the immense online tutorials too. Um, a lot of people do blogs and videos on Drupal, as we all know, and that was a huge resource. Um, a lot of other options felt like you had to pay to get those type of things. So that all comes down to the community which sold me. I know that's kind of our mantra, come for the coast, stay for the community. That really resonates with me. Um, and that's why I'm here. Um, it's also because it's more than just the code, is that? Um, <coughs> open source is about the community around the code, right? You can get software, you can do that, but it's the people that make open source be special it, because it isn't just, like I said, it's not just the free code, but it's how we all act and how we collaborate and we openly share. So it makes the community sharing of ideas, friends, meetups, and conferences. You know, we're sharing with each other, and then we talk, we get our friends hooked, and we start going, we make a meetup, and you start going to conferences like these, where you meet more people, you start chatting, and that's really what helps it thrive and grow, and that's why I'm a huge fan of the, the Drupal community's way of doing conferences. Um, I know WordPress now has more WordCamps, but when I first got started, like, there's nothing near me at all. Um, so Drupal and the community brought new opportunities for myself. Um, at my previous, at my, the first job I went to, we became 100% Drupal because we were more streamlined. Um, the community support allowed me to fulfill more projects. Like as I learned and I gained knowledge from the community, we were able to take on more work. It was like having all of you on, like behind me, like, oh, here, here's a solution to something. It also got me my first freelance gig. Um, through that e-commerce project, I contributed a lot to the shipping modules because there were some bugs and I was like, I get this for free, I gotta do something back at least. And it got me a gig. I was like, someone else wants to actually pay me to write code? I was like, I didn't think it was possible because I had huge imposter syndrome. Um, and actually, the person who freelance, let me freelance for them, sent me to Drupal Camp Atlanta, which is probably the most pivotal moment in my career is that act of kindness. Um, it was my first code conference. I went there and people were like, oh yeah, hey, just come with us. Come get some lunch, come get some dinner. I, was like, I don't know you, but awesome. Um, I was really shell-shocked by the community. Um, Ultimike was like, oh, you should go back, plant a flag, start a user group, so I did. Um, and that's actually where I first became a module co-maintainer is Commerce Reports. I don't know if anybody's had the pleasure of using that module. Um, but I, I chatted with Ryan before I actually got to knew, know him about that, and he's like, well, just become a co-maintainer. Like, if you have ideas and changes, just go do it. I was like, shoot, fine, I'll, I'll just go do it. Um, and that is what kind of kicked off my um, dive into being part of the community of Drupal. Um, so the community is vital to open source. It's all of us, it's the companies in it, we, we put in and help it grow. Networking and meeting similar individuals, such as going to the conferences. Um, it provides a way to show skill set and interact with others. So as I said, I had imposter syndrome, because where I'm from, I was, the, I was the only kid in grade school that wrote code. I didn't know anybody else. I was like, I was a nerd guy. I played video games and wrote code and made some websites. Um, and then moving forward, the only jobs were in the Chicago area, which meant I'd have to drive two and a half hours for work. And I was like, no way am I spending five hours of my day on top of an eight hour day to go pursue this hobby because I didn't think it was a career. But then open source validated the community. is like, I actually have a skill set and I don't need to worry about not knowing anything because we all, there's something that we all don't know, but we can all help teach each other. And it also creates a demand for skills and people with those skills, to, you know, the economy, right? We're building a product and a community, which then drives people to adopt it, which can help bring jobs. Um, and so that's all what got me here. You know, I look back to it, it started, Dries happened to open source Drupal, which is why we're all here and we all have a lot of jobs in Drupal. 
Um, back when Ryan was working at Prima Supply, luckily <coughs> he was told to go build Ubercart. And then, you know, that story went on to commerce guys and people commerce. That got me a job. Um, and an unknown amount of people in this room. And then Ryan actually made a good point about Boyan, our 2.x lead. He got into the Google Summer of Code as Ryan's, Ryan was his mentor. And now look at Boyan. He's already, he keynote at Drupal Camp Tel Aviv. He's been at a handful of other ones here in Europe and he's building Drupal Commerce too. Like he helped get Composer in Drupal 8 um, and all that. And even a friend of mine went from selling cars and I was like, hey, I got a job for you and got him hired at my other firm. And so he went on Code Academy, showed on the source of Drupal and now he's actually at Acromedia, our affiliate partner in Canada. So I helped him get a job as well through the open source. And we contribute more than code. So we contribute support, like I said. It's all about helping others. Uh, inspiration. When I first got started, I looked at, even Mr. Hook here, um, Ryan, Boyan, all the, com actually the, the OG commerce guys. I was like, I want to be like those people. Like the code they write is phenomenal. And I set that standard for myself and kind of like, this is what I want to be like. And then once I actually got to meet them and realize they're people too, it's like, I'm actually, I'm there. Awesome. Like it's not this, really super high goal. And then jobs, which I think is one of the, the greatest parts because it does help empower people. I went from like, I don't know where I would be right now if I didn't necessarily have it. I'd probably still be lugging beer and then have bad knees, a bad back, and who knows where I would be right now. Um, so these are my motivators when I contribute and even building Drupal Commerce. Um, if I help build a better Drupal Commerce, you all that work in dev shops have something you can sell the clients to compete with the other products out there, which, you know, there is no perfect solution for one client. You, you should use, you know, WooCommerce when it's appropriate, Magento or Drupal Commerce when it's appropriate, and the better product we build allows you to have those options to pitch to people and better, com and better compete with other firms that might be solely X or whatever product. Um, and then knowing it also goes into helping Drupal, which then can help others reach this kind of same goal. Um, it also makes opportunities that make an impact, and this really resonated at Drupal Camp Dublin with the Dries note, where you went through the, what did you call it, the, the Meaningful Moments blog post and then all the videos, um, especially the apprenticeship program that happens here. That like blew me away because I feel that's something that it would be great if every community could pull something like that off. Help train people, actually be like a, you know, a developer incubator and be able to hand them off to an agency and say, here you go. Um, because in, in the States, especially around by me, it was heavy in auto industry and also um, coal. Those jobs are pff, gone. Um, so being able to take open source as a way to train people and get them into a new job set is a way that could totally change. It's not going to fix the world or save the world, but it can help a lot of people out. Um, and to touch on that, in the States, in Westford, it's in Kentucky, actually, a few years ago I read an article about BitSource. It's the guy that used to be a coal miner, became a developer, and the topic was can you teach a miner how to code? I think they're not like 40, 40 people, uh, their website said. Um, and you know, they're not just, they started out Drupal. They used Drupal as a way to build an agency, get people a comparable job. Because as they said, a coal miner would make 60 to 80,000 US dollars a year. Well, when those jobs are gone, their alternative is working at McDonald's minimum wage. You can't live on that. Um, so the, the agency provided them a living wage. And now they do like, mono, like open source C Sharp. They said they do some app development. So it's crazy to see that open source allowed them to build a company, expand the company, and kind of help revitalize their community, which you know, kind of fell to the wayside once coal went away. So that's where I think that open source really drives opportunities and can make a difference in people's lives. Because as I said, it brought me from where I was at to here. Thank you. Okay, um, has anyone got any questions for Matt? Wow. <laughs> oh, there, Jam. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I was reading I was reading about uh, the Coleman thing that you just posted in um, your story perfectly exemplifies something that I've been trying to figure out. How do you think that we can, as a community, you know, grow our community, help make help even more in the world by removing the idea? How do we how do we fix the idea that coding is something for elites only? Right? It's it's something that regular people can do. Yeah, so I actually had a conversation at my son's school with that. I'm gonna be volunteering to teach the coding club to fourth and fifth graders. And there is that period, they're like, this is magic. They think of the Matrix, right, when all the stuff's scrolling on the screen and what they show in the movies. And I showed them Scratch, or they have this robot called Dash, and you take your iPod, and it's, it's just like Scratch, but it makes a robot go beep up, boop, boop, move around. And I show that to some of the other parents that their kids want to get involved. I'm like, oh, we can buy this and do it at home. We can make it a game. Um, I know gamification is like the new hot trend, but it works. Simplifying it, showing that code is just troubleshooting, thought process, and log like logic changes. Like, do I do this or do I do that? And trying to find a way to just bring that down to a super simple level um, can help lower that barrier. I mean, I know the way I've also told people is CNC machines at shops. People are being replaced by robots. So you need to learn how to be able to program those. And there's a very simple language, like if that, do this. Um, so things like Scratch, I think, can really help show people that and also build skills that they're going to need in the new workforce. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so it, it seems to me as if um, a lot of happy coincidences has happened to you. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you took these opportunities. Yeah. Um, um, but how do we... Yeah, they don't, in your presentation, you've given a whole series of things which have happened to you. You've met people, you've seen a video that's inspired you, or you, you've been brave and you've gone forward and done stuff, and, and it, it, it's kind of exploded and you've done very well and, and you've inspired some people along the way as well. How do we do a better job at creating these happy coincidences and almost you know, possibly it's happened? Do you have I, any ideas around that? I wish I knew. I know I can't take all the credit for myself because luckily I had a very supporting wife. Um, when I quit the beer delivery job, I did take like a $10,000 salary hit um, to go pursue a career and she stuck by me then and when I quit all of my other jobs. Um, I think to help foster that kind of growth is getting people to meetups and conferences by trying to do some more meetups and talk to friends. Um, it's all about talking to people and just pulling out the thread. You know, my friend Justin has a job now at that. Um, we have another gentleman named Mike who came to some of the meetups. Drupal wasn't his thing. He's like, I can do this. I can go to school. I can be a senior. I can be a developer. He now works at wantable.com and is like a Ruby and Angular developer for them. All because we, we talked to him about what we do. He came to a meetup. It was like the, the imposter syndrome got blown away. So I think it's just talking and showing people that it's not some scary thing. Like, we're all people, we're all human, we all make mistakes, we don't know everything. And you said something quite profound, actually, I think, that uh, you had the perception it wasn't a real job. That, yeah. Um, to, and that was only three years ago. Uh, about five, about five, six, yeah. It was my weekend you thing that I did. That that's the case, and if so, uh, what can you do to make that perception, to, to break those perceptions? I really don't know if that's the case. <sighs> I wanted to ask a few people that and see if they think that it's still like, oh, it's a hobby. Maybe in some of the more closed off areas where it's not, there's no, there isn't like a mainstream tech, like IT type, um, IT workforce or whatever you want to call it. So in my town, we still have one company and then we have a marketing firm. So for all I know, there could be kids that think that. But a lot's changed in five years. Like now we have, like GitHub's exploded. It's more... Coding has become more of a social thing. Um, it's become more into the mainstream. I mean, back then, right? That's when I was tweeting via text message, and Facebook wasn't even open, was had just opened up to like the public. And now we live and breathe Facebook, Twitter, all of those. So I think I don't know if people might think it's still just like a hobbyist. They know they might be able to get a career, so they might see it as a career path. But jumping into it could, is still the difficult part, I would imagine. Um, which, if that's the way you could reach out to people, like, just come to this meetup, just meet these people, just give it a shot. I mean, Drupal's great because you can build anything in the UI. You don't need to necessarily be a coder to build an MVP, um, an MVP product. Any other questions? So, 
like you, you talked about your town and kind of the, the, the way the economy changed there. There's still a, a massive drive for lots of talented software developers to move to the valley. Do you think, like, how do we foster a kind of sense of kind of remote first? Because you're, you're commerce guys, you're fairly remote. Yeah. Uh, how how do we? How do you encourage that? Like, because one of the, the difficulties of people not seeing it as a proper job is like you work from home. You can't possibly work from home. Yeah. Um, it's it's mystified. I, I go and drop my son off. And be like, so you're going to go to the office? Like, no, I'm going to go back to my basement. It's the the biggest part. I think there needs to be like a revolution of sorts in management because management still thinks that they need to micromanage. They need to see you to see that you're productive. If it's kind of the whole, if a tree falls in the forest, doesn't make a sound. Well, they think no, it's not going to. You're not going to work. You're at home. Um, so I think getting management to embrace that, and then also. It just it has to be exposed more. I mean, in my town, there might be some people that work at home, but I don't know them. So one of my goals is I want to try to open a co-working office. We don't have one. I don't want to work in my basement all the time. So I want to try to open a co-working space to then draw out those people. And then that's one way it can help grow, is just getting those people together and saying, oh, we are actually a, a force in our community. Um, I actually got the pleasure of being interviewed by the local newspaper because they, they heard about the conference, and we talked about remote workers. And some of the feedback was, well, what about, <coughs> there's legal assistants that work at home. There's people who do transcripts. There's the old school medical coders back in the day. So there's a whole untapped, um, whole untapped group of people that actually work from home that are, you don't think about because they're not developers. And it's, if there's a way to highlight that and show like this is like the unrepresented workforce that can help bring into the mainstream and I think push that forward. Any other questions? I'll come, I'll do that. Now. <laughs> um, so, what was one of the most that was contested in, well, in Drupal? Like, you, you have to think about from Drupal 5 to Drupal 8, the complexity is quite like, yeah. a lot. How do we, as a community, avoid scary people? Like there's new coders, new people have just started, or even people coming from other systems, coming from other systems might be simpler, but look at Drupal, you know, careful moments. So, so I started with Drupal 7, um, and D8 definitely was a huge change. For the better, it got rid of code. It was too late, in my opinion. It should have been sooner. Um, but it just fixed a lot of problems. There was the code base. I, I'm not a fan of the function, like procedural programming. I do like the OOP, which I know it brings it to like a more enterprise level, you could say, because it's object oriented. But not really. Like that's just modern programming. If you look, JavaScript's becoming typed and having objects. Um, I think it's a good thing because you can get people that like are Java developers and go into it. It helps cross the bridge. People can easily more adapt, adapt it more easily. Um, but to help prevent scaring people is people using Drupal 8, like, it's not scary. I've said that since day one. I installed the health. I was like, this is a great improvement that we have on our hands. Um, and the new semantic version is going to help, too. Now that we have all the minor releases, which I think has kicked off way better than I anticipated, um, I'm, I really applaud the decision to do that. And that's going to help ease the fear. So this was the big scare, right? I think D8 was the big scare. It's like, we have to change the way that we do our builds. We have to change the way that we write code. We have to just change the way that we understand things, which is always scary, because right, that's a threat to how you work. Um, but we have to just embrace the change and see, OK, how can we prevent this from happening again? Semantic version, talking to people, just tr maybe getting more in the process of the changes that are there. Now, following court is near impossible. I, I try to like pay attention. But the one thing I'll do is I go look at some of the change records. And I'm like, oh, well, this was a huge change. And I'll try to chime in, you know, give my opinion. Um, so maybe that could be one thing too, trying to get community feedback on some of the pending big changes, which I feel a lot of the subsystem maintainers do a good job of considering that though. Um, I just think that the D7 to D8 jump just took too long and it, it was, I think just too many people got burnt out. So that other, getting rid of the, the scary parts just kind of fell behind, I think. I kind of follow up kind of from uh, Last question. Um, you know the off the cliff diagram? 
Yeah. The WordPress and Joomla. How do we change that perception? So, I think that's hilarious, that infographic, because I think of Drupal as the opposite way. You, you, so, it, you can start out and then you hit this huge curve, but with, with Drupal, you can create an MVP so easily. Um, I, I don't really know where that learning curve comes from, because that's what I hit with WordPress. I, I, I started, I needed to build a content type, and I was like, okay, well, let's write some code for this. I needed to be able to dynamically set up a theme. So I ported Omega 3 and the block concept into a WordPress theme. So that way I could easily build sites. And that's when I was like, screw this, I'm doing Drupal. Um, so I don't know why it says Drupal's all of a sudden this huge curve because WordPress is like that. You, you go here, that's like, oh, I need this functionality. Go here, because it has, its, it, it has its place. It is a great blogging platform. When you try to make it more, you hit that curve. So I think all the CMSs are that way. Um, <laughs> Especially since in Drupal you can use the UI for so much. Like, yeah, you have a lot of clicking to do, and we have a lot of options. Of course, everything's going to be a pain, but you don't necessarily have to build. You don't have to write code to build a very functional website. So I don't. I don't know how we can get rid of that. Maybe just better documentation. But documentation is hard. A Drupal diagram of our own cliff. Yeah. Of our own. Any uh, final questions? Um, I was, <coughs> you were mentioning earlier that uh, uh, you, you didn't have any sort of formal education in, in programming or whatever. Uh, and I was wondering whether now <coughs> you feel that that will be useful or whether you have sort of organic, you learned all you, you feel is needed. So I actually did go back to the university and I did get a bachelor's in software engineering. Um, I graduated last year, right, right as I was like, starting the book is when I, I finished school. Looking back, the, the, the debt, I'm like, this is a stupid decision. Um, but when, when that's gone, I think it was valuable, um, especially the hindsight factor. I was able to take things that I learned in the field and apply them to what I was learning. Because I've always had a gripe about going to school to be a software engineer, because what, the, oh, do a binary research. It's like, I've never had to do that. They teach, the, some of the code I had to learn, it, it didn't really give me value, but it was all the other parts. All the parts about being a good speaker, being a good manager, being all of the other things that go into being a developer that isn't code, that we all forget about, because we're just like, okay, do the code, do the code, but then there's public speaking, there's this. There's communicating to your clients, there's communicating to your boss, um, and it just also taught me how to be a better like, team lead. Um, at that time, I was a project lead at a previous company, and it just kind of helped me get on track with where I wanted to be. And I think it actually made a great transition into commerce guys. And being a, being a co-maintainer of Drupal Commerce kind of gave me that frame of reference. Like, how can I be a good maintainer? How can I properly groom our contributors, to make them feel welcomed, to want to keep coming back? Um, so I think it is worth it. And I think it is good if you already have some experience, then go back. Because then you'll get more out of it. You're not going to be so much lost in the woods, um, which I, my friend Mike that went to the meetup and then went to school, I think that has helped him too. Because he, he went to a few meetups before that, and then he went to the local tech college, and he's going, and he's also working alongside it. So as he's doing code, he's learning in school and being able to more be able to apply it properly. I think. Cool. So thank you very much, Brad and Matt, for the uh, amazing inspiration.